So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome from where you are in the world. My name is Andrew Brown. I'm the Senior Director for Health Workforce Development from IntraHealth, and I have the privilege of being your facilitator today for this 90-minute webinar, The Big Picture of Human Resources for Health Data and Information Systems. And this is brought to you with, from VitaWave, IntraHealth, and Cooper Smith. Just a couple of um, items as we begin. If you take your cursor and you move to the bottom of the screen, you'll notice on Zoom that the bottom bar will appear. A couple of things I want you to see there. One is that you can choose a translation option. Uh, today, we have English, we have French, and we have Spanish. Please choose uh, which language option you would like. I'd also want to draw your attention, if you move your cursor to the left, you will see a chat. That chat will be active uh, throughout the whole webinar. We would invite you to start with, uh, to type in your name, your position, your organization and the country that you're coming from. And also, if you have questions for our panelists, to the left, you will see the question and answer tab. I would encourage you to use that and we will be actively answering your questions as we proceed uh, through the webinar today. Um, next slide, please. Just a bit of an overview of what to expect. Uh, this is a, a 90 minute webinar as we wanted to make sure that you had ample time to interact with the panelists and to have your questions answered about this fantastic topic that we're going to address. After some welcome and remarks, uh, we're going to really um, move into uh, the key research that we've conducted with this Gates grant. Uh, and we're going to give some deep dive findings and some recommendations. We have the pleasure of giving you a deep dive from the country of Uganda uh, as part of an overall a global assessment uh, as well. And then you'll have plenty of time at the end of our webinar in order to um, have your questions answered. So hang on for the ride. Please use the chat to interact and tell us as you go. And um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Brooke Partridge, who's the CEO and founder of VitaWave. Uh, Brooke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us today. The body of work that has brought us all together is a year long study, uh, as Andrew mentioned, commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to answer some important and fundamental questions about um, human resources for health in low and middle income countries. What sparked this activity within the Gates Foundation, what caused them to commission the work, were questions about how and what countries know about their workforce. Do governments know where their health workers are? Um, uh, do they know um, uh, when they're working? How do they get paid? These questions led us to explore the role of systems, both paper-based and digital, that house the relevant data and make it available to people in the health systems who are making decisions and managing their workforce. While we started this work prior to COVID-19, uh, these questions have only become more relevant and important. Health workers are at the heart of any health system. However, many countries do not have accurate counts of their workforce and or about their distribution by region, cadre or sector. We are in a phase of health systems generally where most low and middle income countries are transitioning from paper to digital and ultimately to interoperable systems that will talk to one another and overcome silos. But this process can be clumsy and it can make um, a country's ability to manage their health workforce even more difficult as they go through that transition. So with all of this in mind, the, um, we had the goal of, um, of understanding and characterizing the support and management of, of the health workforce. And we brought together a consortium that included two additional organizations, IntraHealth and Cooper Smith. It's been a great partnership. Each brought a unique perspective to this work. IntraHealth has been a mainstay in the global health community, especially with respect to HRH for quite some time. And Cooper Smith brings a strong, a strong experience base in performance assessment and management within healthcare programs. Their experience, their respective experience, combined with VitalWave's deep practice in global digital health and system strengthening, allowed us to embark on a learning journey that culminated in insights and recommendations for how countries can improve their data availability and use in relation to their health workforce. 
In addition, um, we had a very valuable advisory committee working with us. Most importantly, our primary member being the WHO, um, providing key inputs into the process. And the findings from this work are now publicly available and um, are a published report that explores the questions um, beginning with those that I mentioned earlier and diving into many more with a lot of detail on the landscape across a range of country experiences, uh, particularly in Oman, Mozambique, Burkina Faso, and Uganda. Increasingly, digital health is becoming a fundamental part of health systems generally. By no means is digital the complete solution, but it is an essential component. In the context of HRH, universal healthcare, disease specific domains, both infectious and chronic, country level digital health systems that are interoperable and allow for ubiquitous access across the country are critical to dramatically reducing morbidity and mortality. This is because of the um, improvements that digital systems can make in health service delivery of which the health, worker, uh, the health workforce is um, a critical part. As digital health systems scale nationally and even regionally and are being applied across all aspects of the health system, we are seeing common issues that are inhibiting their scale and sustainability. These include topics such as governance, uh, data security, ID management, capacity building, long-term funding, and a host of other issues. And they come up regularly in the context of all health domains. HRH is no exception. So we'll be hearing today not only about HRH specific challenges and opportunities, but also those that are common in digital health um, across, across health systems generally. With that in mind, I'd like to, to turn the mic over to Jim Campbell, who is the director of the Health Workforce Department at the World Health Organization. As I mentioned, they've been an important advisory partner in this work that we've done. Drawing from, from the work his department does within the WHO, Jim will be sharing with us the importance of health workers, HRH, and its link to the global strategy, uh, the global strategy for health workforce in two, for 2030. Over to you, Jim. Brooke, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants from around the world, to Polly and Andrew and other panelists today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join today's event and for the, uh, for the, uh, the great collaboration that my team and Brooke and her team have been working on and with Andrew and others for several months now. Just a few opening remarks in terms of the context. Indeed, Brooke mentioned uh, the International Year of the Health and Care Workers uh, in recognition of their, their service, their sacrifice at the forefront of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a decision that was taken in the World Health Assembly in November of last year. In January, we put forward a campaign for the year, uh, which had five clear objectives uh, to drive the vaccination effort of health and care workers given priority, uh, to give them that additional protection, uh, to measure, uh, recognize and commemorate all those health and care workers who've lost their lives, uh, to try and get new commitments to protect and invest in health and care workers, knowing the, the, the impact of COVID-19 on their uh, working conditions and their livelihoods is such a shock. To, to work and create a dialogue on a global care compact, this duty of care that our, uh, employers and states have to their workers. And to do this together in partnership uh, with all those with uh, agency and association in this game. Several of those objectives have a measurement agenda. Um, how do we ensure that the world's health and care workers are vaccinated as part of the COVID-19 response? How do we commemorate and recognize their deaths? And a, a new publication uh, that we have here at WHO in our estimate that somewhere between 80,000 and 180,000 health workers will have died 
from COVID-19 up until the uh, May of this year. And the, with a, an, an estimate which converges to a scenario, medium scenario of about 115,000 workers. And that's 115,000 deaths, which are far, far, far too many. What do we know on the measurement of the vaccination effort? Uh, as at September uh, of this year, uh, with available data from 119 countries, uh, we have information and reports suggesting that two in five, 40% of health and care workers have been fully vaccinated. But there's considerable difference around the world across regions and economic groupings, just as we see global inequity on the vaccine. So we see inequity in health workers being vaccinated. Only one in 10 health workers in Africa and uh, the Western Pacific have been vaccinated, whereas as many as 80% in high income countries. And so really the, the message here, the measurement is continuously, continuously with our agenda. The global strategy, one of four objectives in the global strategy, which is a, a, a program of work over 15 years. One of those four objectives is on data, evidence, knowledge, information systems. If you will all recall, the World Health Report in 2006 really rang home uh, a narrative in the MDG era that we were not doing enough to have uh, information available to inform policy, to inform dialogue on our workforce, our service coverage for the MDG targets. We, there was an HRH reference group established in 2009, 2010, which looked again, uh, bringing experts from all around the world, what could be done to improve the way that we measure. A, after the RECIFE, the third global forum on human resources for health in RECIFE, a health workforce data group was established to say, what would the global strategy need to do in this area? And then from 2016, the global strategy, one of four objectives, the development and the implementation of national health workforce accounts and the work of the GWEN data and evidence hub, which many uh, of you are just looking at the names and the participants are actively engaged with and helping WHO continuously compile data and evidence. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a priority for the World Health Organization. It's a priority uh, for my team, um, including many of the, the very, very uh, competent statisticians and experts we have here in our organization. Uh, it's a priority in the SDGs, and I'm really encouraged to see um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is starting to, to question also um, what can be the response that we need. This study hopefully will start to continue to enable our thinking, our thoughts, and implementation. But we need to take that global picture down to the country level. We need to measure implementation of the global strategy. We need to measure implementation of universal health coverage in SDG 3. And we can only do that with working as part of the International Year of Health and Care Workers that we said together to make this a reality in countries all around the world. Uh, so Brooke and, and Polly, uh, Andrew, colleagues, thank you very much for uh, the original uh, outreach to WHO to, to develop uh, some of this study together, collaboratively in the advisory group. Thank you for the opportunity to, to also participate today. And we look forward to the dialogue. Uh, and thank you, in particularly to those members of my team that have been carrying this work forward for many, many years. Uh, back to you, Andrew. Jim, thank you very much uh, for that overview. And uh, Brooke, the, the context of uh, digital health and the importance of digital is very clear. But unless we make that data actionable, um, it's not good enough. And I'd like to introduce to you Polly Dumford, President and CEO of Interhealth International, to help give us that perspective. Thanks, Polly. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew and Brooke and Jim. It's such a pleasure to be here today. 
and really acknowledge this cooperation between Vital Wave, Cooper Smith, um, and also with funding from the Gates uh, Foundation. I think this is important work and the lessons that we learned today will further all of our efforts so that country we can work with countries so there is improved active management of health workforce. We know that a functional human resource information system, be it digital or paper-based or a blend, are critical to the supply of needed data that countries need to plan and manage their health workforce. So they know how many health workers they have, where they're located, their education and skills and the different mix that exists and their performance. And um, as Brooke mentioned earlier, this was important before COVID-19 pandemic, but now of course, pandemic has put the health workers in the global spotlight, but yet many national governments still do not have accurate counts of health workers they employ or details on how they perform. So we know that safety really does start at the top. We need strong systems driven by data. Countries need access to data that will help them surge health workers during outbreaks, forecast the need for protective equipment and get vaccines to those who need them. Uh, Jim uh, highlighted still the vast majority of health workers do not have access to these vaccines, and that is absolutely critical. So, for example, uh, you know, InterHealth worked with, in the beginning of the pandemic, with several governments, Mali, Kenya, and others, to use data from human resource information systems mixed with uh, DHS surveys and other national uh, information systems to identify populations at severe risk of symptoms of COVID and then to model the timing and magnitude of outbreaks in their countries when the wave was coming. And then to wrap it to understand where health workers are, different cotters that were available, and when we would need them the most given the predicted uh, surge in COVID-19. So that was allowing governments to rapidly mobilize and prepare health workers for the response, to have the health workers where they needed them at the right time. So this is the kind of data-driven action that we need and the research being presented today demonstrates the great amount of work, I mean, how much has already been done, but also the great amount of work that still needs to be done to improve human resource information systems so that governments are be able to see the big picture. Of course, what is happening in where health workers are in the public sector, but also the private, the nonprofit workers, and also community health workers are essential uh, to holistic uh, responses. So. This is important now as we're trying to surge and roll out vaccines. And it's also important in preparing for a future crisis and also for maintaining essential services at the same time. So we're proud to partner with all of you and we'll continue to focus and work alongside countries to move this agenda forward because without health workers, we all know that health work doesn't happen. Thank you so much. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Polly. And, and the stage is set, and now we're going to get into the meat of our work. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to remind everyone of a couple of things. Uh, one, if you take your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you will notice that there is a line of icons. This is being translated into English, into French and Spanish. We would encourage you to choose uh, the language of your choice. We'd also encourage you, if you move to the left with your cursor, there's the chat function please take the time to introduce yourself. Um, and then to the left a bit further is the question and answer section. We would encourage you to be typing in questions as our panelists are speaking today. And uh, we will answer some of those in real time. And then after our presentations, we'll come to an interactive discussion together. Next slide, please. I'd like to now introduce to you Leia Gatt, the Director of Professional Services from VitalWave. And she's going to give us an overview and really the key takeaways from this very interesting research. Thanks, Leah. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So uh, I'll start by giving a little bit of an overview of the goal of this work, as well as some of the key questions, um, and then take, take you through some of the high level findings. So this assessment sought to identify what are the concrete opportunities in LMICs to better think about the planning and management of the health, health workforce. Um, and thinking about that understanding of what is the current state of systems within countries. But as the saying goes, you can't manage what you can't really understand. Uh, so enumerating the health workforce is one of the critical tasks faced by the global health uh, and, and countries all over the world. 
So our, our assessment is driven by a few fundamental questions that really get to the heart of understanding human resources for health management. And those are, how do countries know where their health workers are? Do countries know how health workers perform if they shop for work and how are they paid? And if we can go to the next slide, to answer these questions, we conducted over our, our, our assessment over the course of a year. We started with the targeted landscaping in 20 countries of so April of last year, just as, as the pandemic was hitting. Um, and through this landscaping, we looked to get a sense of what existed across a variety of countries, what kind of systems were in place and what level of maturity. Um, from there, we went on to conduct a number of focused assessments, uh, focusing in on really mapping and following HRH data across different levels of the health system. And that is much of what we'll share with you now. But this, this was then all used to inform recommendations for how um, the global health world can, can help to support HRH planning. Um, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit further, but they're also available within the report. So this slide here gives you a snapshot of not only the number, but the diversity of sources. Um, we spoke with over 160 people in total, over 20 countries. In our interviews, Ministry of Health employees were really central to our approach, but we were also um, careful to include a number of other stakeholders um, within professional councils, for example, and also those at the sub-national level. So we, we placed great emphasis on understanding systems and use of information and management at sub-national levels because the needs and challenges of these actors are often not as understood, but any viable solutions that need to be built need to take the needs into account. Can go to the next slide. For our methodology, we wanted to ground ourselves in use cases that were most directly relevant to the foundational questions that were shared earlier. And these can be seen in the bulleted list along the left. So using these use cases, we then went to a process of mapping the flow of data all the way from the level of the health worker up into the national level um, and, and you know, how, how that information flows up, how and if it flows down, um, and trying to understand what kind of data is collected, what are the decisions and actions that are made. Um, and this gave us a good system level view of where the bottlenecks happen, where things break down, and as a result could help to help us understand better where solutions might be most useful. It also gave us a great view into where best practices can actually be found across the countries. So we, we also paired this with an actor level view. So thinking about the use cases, um, who are the critical actors involved in decision making? in everyday management of HRH, so that we can understand the challenges from their view as well. Next slide. Before we get into the findings, it would just be beneficial to level set a little bit. There are a few things that would need to be in place for effective and functional workforce management. And here, I'll just take you through a little bit of sort of our definition of what does good look like for HRIS. So the first thing, you need an established source of truth for health workers across all of the sectors. For most countries, what this means is focusing on having an accurate count and an up-to-date list of workers and where they are. In many countries, there isn't one source, there are multiple. You need a unique ID in place to help to link key data to a unique health worker. You need functionality that meets the needs of users at all levels, and that supports the tasks that they perform, such as administrative and management functions. You need to have access, the users themselves need to be able to access the data when they need it in ways that um, protect individual security and privacy. And this, this requires an understanding of who has access and authority to see what kind of data. And then finally, because HRH is unique in that there are multiple sources of data spread across different systems and actors, as we'll see soon, 
you need data to be effectively shared across different sources, including payroll, HRIS, HMIS, and the master facilities. Few countries have this in place. Overall, you know, there are many pathways to get to this state and countries have a diversity of experience that will impact how they could get there. But overall, these components need to be supported by the green blocks that you see at the bottom. These are some of the key found foundations. So what kind of governance and ownership is in place, the right kind of incentives, as well as systems that are designed to match the context um, of of the countries in which they are in. The recommendations that we're putting forward largely focus on these three things, but we want to foreshadow this for you a little bit. Um, and, and with that now, we can go into our findings and the results. And specifically, we'll, we'll start to look at how the different countries we focused on for our deep dives are doing against the foundational questions. So with that, if we could go over to the next slide. So starting at the top, at the top row, when it comes to knowing where health workers are, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some countries have less, on a sense, less of a sense, re relying more on paper files at the facility level, for example, or staff, staff lists, and only have aggregate counts at other levels of the health system. Um, with, Mo with Mozambique and Uganda, a better sense with cadre data available at, at the facility level, although it was reported that this data is not always up, up to date. Having the data here is one thing, but accessing it and having access to it is another issue. Um, and many countries reported that they had a hard time accessing HRIS data, particularly at some of the sub subnational levels. And this really serves to undermine system engagement and use. Looking at the next questions, how do how do they perform, whether governments know how, how, they, how they perform and whether they shop for work. Here is one of the major gaps that we found. Um, you know, when it comes to everyday admin and management functionality, particularly for areas of thinking about attendance um, and how are, how, how are health workers performing, this, this was fairly lacking. All countries that we looked at in the deep dives had um, more, so the system that they used were um, mostly paper and the processes were not really informed um, by the use of, of data. Mozambique and Uganda have new systems in development that seek to address these, these gaps. But this was a finding that resonated not only across the deep dive countries that you see here, but across the 20 that were reviewed as part of our earlier scan. And this, I think, speaks to a broader trend that we saw. Lastly then, um, when it comes to how health workers are paid, an, an, an interesting and positive finding was when it came to payroll systems, we found consistently um, that they were fairly robust salary payment systems in place. All health workers in the formal health, uh, the for formal workforce in these countries were paid through a direct, uh, generally a transfer into their bank account, and payroll is considered an important HRH source. Um, all health workers, uh, so I think here we see that sort of great progress has been made over the years. There, there were cases we heard of health workers in rural areas um, needing to travel to collect their salaries because there were no banks around and that this could um, take a, a number of days in instance. But overall, um, the processes for the transfers itself worked, worked well. If we could go to the next slide, when we look outside of the public sector to the private sector workforce and community health workers, a different picture comes forward. Data on these are frequently unavailable, um, impeding decision-making and planning. In Mozambique and Burkina, there are policies in place to allow for the Ministry of Health to have oversight of the private sector. But even though those were in place, they weren't really um, acted on at the time that we were doing our work. Data that are available on the private sector are generally coming from labor force and facility surveys, but these are generally not up to date. We also see the absence of data on the community health workers, which is clear. Even at the most basic level, 
um, such as how many community health workers are in the country, where they are, who, who is active, um, as well as a lack of integration of such data within national HRIS systems. As a result, community health workers are much less likely to be counted, which then limits the ability to fully leverage them. Um, it, it also prevents sufficient planning. Um, and while we looked at professional councils, um, which should be a strong source for health workforce data, what we found is that these are often under-resourced and lack the capacity um, to do the jobs that they are meant to do. So this, this, this lack of data on community health workers and the private, sec and the private sec sector workforce means that Ministry of Health, deployment decisions, planning, um, don't take these health workers into account. Going to the next slide, when we looked across the different use cases and sort of analyzed the bottlenecks to, to the findings we've, we've, we've just looked over, we found that generally the challenges sort of grouped into four areas. One, as you see here, here on the screen, lack of data available on the health worker, on the health workforce. That's both within the public sector, within the private sector, and for community health workers. The next area was issues having to do with data quality and use. The next group had to do with systems that were fragmented um, and tools that don't meet user needs. And lastly, we had issues related to insufficient capacity to actually manage the systems. There isn't a, a revelation here, I think a huge amount of validation. These bottlenecks have been noted in other areas of digital health. Um, these are um, really critical issues. Now, what, what we've done in this assessment is to get to a level of assessment that sort of identifies these issues within the context of HRH. And this allows us to share the areas where support can be most helpful. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, before we get into some of the specific findings for, for, for countries, I, I'd just like to introduce the three countries we conducted our deep dive assessment in, because each of these countries were specifically selected for a context that, um, for, for their context. Um, in West Africa, Burkina Faso, fairly early stages, um, in many ways it exemplifies a lot of problems we see in HRH, especially in low resource. But, but as, as at the same time, we also found a number of important structures from a governance perspective and processes um, that are, are, are being put into place. In Mozambique, um, this gave us a really interesting picture of a country that has made substantial progress in HRH to progressively built and homegrown systems that have really created a strong sense of ownership. And finally, in Uganda, a decentralized health system where there's been a lot of investment in HRIS. And this is, this is the context that we're going to dive into next. You, you can find more information on all of these um, in the report itself. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Leah. Lots of work behind all of those uh, great messages. But with all those bottlenecks in mind, it's time to hear from anyone who is on the call attending this webinar. We've got a poll for you. For our interpreters, I'm just going to read the answers. So the question is, what is the main bottleneck you experience that limits the effectiveness of human resources information systems? Lack of available data? Compromised data quality and timeliness. Tools and systems do not meet user needs. Lack of user skills to analyze and use data or something else. Please take the time to, uh, to, to fill that in. And while you're doing that, we're going to go to the next slide. And we are very privileged to have with us Dr. Vincent Akecho, who's an independent consultant from Uganda. And he's going to provide an overview of the deep dive findings from this case study. Welcome, Dr. Vincent. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you for giving me opportunity to participate in this webinar and also for the opportunity to participate in the study itself. 
Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, this slide is giving us an overview of the systems of human sources for health um, management in Uganda. And um, if you look at the bottom, there we highlight the key players um, who, who have developed some of the systems that we are going to be talking about. As you can see, Human Resources for Health has many stakeholders, many government ministries and agencies, and that's really due to the complexity of human resource issues. And as you can see, the slide is really busy, and that's the point. Of the agencies that we see at the bottom, some have more than one systems. And so there are many systems that are fragmented, and that's a big problem in Uganda. As you can see from the different colors, the blue green color shows the management information system that are digitalized, but also we have Excel file users as uh, depicted in this slide by the blue color. For example, payroll is usually processed in Excel sheets. And um, you can see the master staff list, master, the staff lists are also done on Excel and also master facility list and so on. The deep blue shows um, individual files, paper-based paper system, for example, individual personnel files are still kept in, in, in paper form at the Ministry of Health and at the district headquarters and so on. And um, some processes are actually processed outside the system itself. Um, for example, the calculations of wheezing, workload in of staffing need and also compiling errors that and correction of errors of the HR data is done on itself and then shared with the people that take decision to correct the errors. And so this slide sort of highlights the, the, the fragmentation of systems the fact that there are very many different systems with some of the issues that we can point out. Um, for example, there's very limited interoperability, if any, and also um, there's little use and, and even awareness of the HRIS, despite the fact that it is, a, it is there. Some managers are not familiar with it. And the case in point, especially the Community Health Workforce Registry, which is not really very well known by many stakeholders. Can we go to the next slide, please? So our assessment looked at data flows in line with the foundational questions that have been alluded to. And this slide, shows the screenshots for each of those data flows that we examined, um, recruitment and deployment, performance management and salary payment data flows. And on top there, uh, we see the key actors that we interfaced with um, among others, the human source managers at different levels, the system administrators, the payroll managers, the district health officers, and so on. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, although we explored all the three foundational questions, because of time constraint, we will mainly focus on 
performance management here, individual performance management. But also in Uganda, this, this stood out as the main problem area. There has been a lot of progress in recruitment and deployment, uh, development of HRIS and use of it in this area. And also salary payment has been moved a lot much, much more than the, the performance management in terms of developing systems that uh, manage payroll and, uh, and salary payments, especially by the means of public service and means of finance. Performance management remained a major issue and uh, I think this assessment was particularly important in this area as it raised the key issues that need to be addressed. And so we look at the individual performance management. Could you move the slide up a bit so we can see the bottom slide? That's the bottom part of the slide. Um, that, very, that very slide, the bottom part. Uh, I'm showing the whole slide. You may need to, slow, to scroll down to see it. OK, the health worker there is where I wanted to start from. Um, so at the health worker level, there are various actions that take place in performance management. The employee discusses with the supervisor the goals to be achieved in the year, and they agree on these goals. Now, I must say that this is not usually universal when we interviewed the DHOs in some districts is not happening, but seems to be more active in area in districts where there's a there are partners, especially projects that uh, finance training and support systems in the districts to develop the health workforce. And in almost every district, there is monitoring of attendance to duty. And this takes two forms. In one form, they are paper, it's paper-based, there are paper registers that are filled by health workers in the morning when they arrive for duty and filled in the evening as they leave the station. In some districts, we're told um, about 22 districts and in about 187 facilities, their biometric system in, uh, systems in place that are being used. In some, they are wall mount, biometric system in others, they are form-based biometric system. The phones were introduced because we're told because of the unreliable power supply. And so these phones are able to, 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 to store some power for at least seven days if they are fully charged and that became very useful. Now, for community health workers, there's a registry that has been put in place uh, with support by development partners. But this is not used everywhere. This is mainly used in 35 districts where the data on performance of the health workers are recorded by the supervisors, mainly the NGOs and the implementing partners of your project. Now at the facility level, the Attendance records are compiled every month uh, for each individual health worker. And also shared with the, this chief administrative officer at the district level for action to be taken. Now the compilation is done by the facility manager at the health facility or by the sub-county chief in the case of field-based staff, and also for the health center in charges, because the health center in charges are actually supervised by the sub-county chief of the area. Now for the community health workers, the performance information is recorded in the registry and compiled at the NGO level and shared within the NGO and action is taken at that level. The information is not usually moved much beyond the NGO 
or the implementing partner that collects it and, and puts it in the registry. Now, at the district level, the summaries of the attendance to duty data from the paper register are put in the HRIS every month to ease analysis and sharing. And attendance to duty is also analyzed at the district level. And the analyzed data is shared with the management at the district level, the, the chief administrative officer, but also with the national level in order to, to further analyze and see to what extent health workers actually attend to duty and, 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 and perform. And this ends up as calculated absenteeism rates by year, which is tracked at national level and also done by CADA and by facility level. Now in districts, some of the districts have been able to use the attendance to duty data to determine whether or not somebody should be paid salary. We're informed that if a health worker did not work for at least 15 days in a month, he may not be paid, he or she may not be paid salary for that month. And this happens in um, a few districts and uh, one particular district that quoted this was in Iganga in the Eastern part of the country where this is now practiced routinely to determine whether or not to pay the health workers given their attendance to duty records. Now, at regional referral hospital level, the attendance to duty is also tracked using biometric machines. All the regional referral hospitals now have biometric machines. And this is linked with the outputs from the statistics, from the service statistics, and also is tracked by the Minister of Health directly. And at the ministry level, they print out the attendance to duty and, and, and analyze and look at how the various regional hospitals are performing in terms of people attending to duty. Now, every three months, there is a meeting to review performance at every level, at, at health facility, at district and regional levels. And this is paper-based. And at the end of the year, overall performance is appraised. Again, this is paper-based and the performance is recorded and, and maintained in personnel files, which are paper based at every level. And this is difficult to use because they're not easily shared and they're not easily accessible because they are kept under lock and key and they are perceived to be confidential confidential records. They're not easily shared by people who may need them to take decisions, except when they need to consider somebody for promotion or somebody is applying for a new position. And so this is a major problem. At every level, HR manager must verify all the performance appraisal reports and ensure that every health worker has completed this appropriately and the various managers at different levels have made their remarks on the performance of the individuals. And also this is maintained on the files. At every level, performance reports are discussed quarterly by the reward and sanctions committee that are established 
to monitor performance and to agree on what reward some people may be given, usually at the end of the year. Uh, people are recognized for their performance and they may receive either a plaque or a letter of acknowledgement or something that can, can be appreciated by them. And uh, just to motivate the others that if they also perform well, they can be recognized. And also to show that when you perform well, there's a reward. I would like to emphasize that although it was said that goals are set by the health workers and the supervisors, these are not usually followed in determining the reward to be given. Ultimately, the reward, the, the, those who win rewards are really considered based on perception of the supervisors and colleagues on their performance. They don't usually refer back to the goals and how these were achieved and so on over time. And this is a major weakness. So in a summary, the key issue here is that most of the management data is paper-based, not easily accessible because they are locked up in confidential registry, not shared, and not always analyzed in, in detail to inform decisions once they have been completed. And it's also common to have a situation where personnel files are incomplete. We were told of a story of a, a senior manager who retired, but when he was processing his terminal benefit and they, they brought out his file, it had only his first appoint, the letter of his first appointment as a medical officer and nothing else. And yet he had been working up to the level of commissioner of health services at the Ministry of Health. Now this just illustrates how the data management in performance uh, area is very poor in the health sector, at particularly in the public health sector. Next, please. And this slide really brings out the key issues in this area. One, just to re-emphasize, is that HR staff maintain personnel file for each health worker deployed. And, and that's the point that it is paper form and that performance appraisal reports along with ad hoc supervision reports and individual reports on activities are kept in the file, again, largely paper-based and, um, and, and usually incomplete or missing because they're not frequently, they're not often well-filed and maintained and they get lost. And just to say that the part of the reason for getting lost is that these forms that are completed by the individuals move through the different levels, the same form moves from the facility level signed by facility in charge to the district health office signed by the health office, district health officer, to the, to the chief administrative officer. And at each of those levels, there are usually bottlenecks, different priorities. The officer in charge has other priorities competing for his time and may sometimes not remember to sign and move on the forms. And so forms get stuck and eventually get mixed up with other documents and get lost. That's one of the major causes of their absence on file. And regarding the community health workforce performance, as we said, is managed by implementing partners and indirectly by the facility staff that um, collaborate with the implementing partners in delivery of services and system strengthening. And the key issue here is that um, the data once entered in the registry, is not even analyzed anyway, and is not accessible or widely shared. And mainly due to insufficient governance structures. Next, please. So in terms of 
what then are, are the managers proposing to do after this? Because we shared the report of this study, of this assessment with the managers at the Ministry of Health and other in institutions that we interfaced with. And um, first to quote, uh, one of the managers said that this was a good study that has highlighted important points of weakness uh, in the HRIS and other systems. Although they knew some of them, they did not fully under understand them. Um, and the, the, the key areas that they emphasize as areas of action from the recommendations of this assessment were one, um, to make existing systems more comprehensive, reducing fragmentation so that all the information a manager needs for decision-making could be found in from one system rather than making them and rather than the current situation where they are fragmented and there are different systems and uh, you want information from one system, then you have no password to, to access the information in another system and makes it uh, cumbersome, you know, to get passwords and so on. And sometimes they just give up and, and therefore makes it less usable. They also propose that um, there should be increased opportunities for stakeholder inputs when information systems are being developed, should be more participatory. And even along the way as analysis is done and so on should be shared and uh, so that opportunities provided for stakeholders to, <clears throat> to point out the missing information that they would have liked or what they did not understand from the information shared and so on, as opposed to the current system where some people are not even aware of the existence of some of the data systems. And at best they get reports that are shared with them after the analysis. And sometimes they, they need data that are not in the reports or they don't even understand some of the, find, uh, some of the reports from the analysis and therefore making it less useful to them. And, the, and the reduces ownership and, and so on. And the third point they're saying is that the current system, uh, HRI system was um, developed mainly with ICT staff, focusing a lot on technology and creating the data system. And the leaders and managers who would use this information were involved much later and they found it hard to follow and internalize some of the data from the system. And so they're saying that moving forward, there would be need to target the leadership for capacity building in order to improve uh, the possibility of use of the system and therefore its sustainability. So these are the three broad areas uh, of immediate action uh, that um, the, the leaders we interfaced with are committing to undertake. Next, please. Ah, I think um, that's the end of my presentation at this point. Dr. Vincent, thank you so much. And we've all got a great appreciation of the complexity as well as some of the specific issues that you've been experiencing. And great to see the, the next steps and that look at governance as a, and leadership development as a way forward. We're gonna hear more about that sh uh, shortly, but on the screen are the results from our poll and uh, very evenly distributed across uh, the four first areas. So. Um, I hope that you can um, feel encouraged in some way that your problems are shared by many others. And hopefully as we move now into our uh, section looking at key takeaways that, and recommendations, that as we listen to Sarah Hyde from Cooper Smith, that you'll be able to get some actionable ideas to help improve the system. So next slide, please. 
And uh, Sarah, who's a performance management specialist from Cooper Smith, is going to lead us through this section. Over to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thanks to my colleagues for their presentation so far. Um, as they've discussed and as we've seen, and we had the ecosystem and data flow mapping that we did, and we also coded bottlenecks according to the types of issues that we identified. And then when looking to strengthen existing systems, we recognize that it is important to dig deeper and examine the underlying factors that cause the bottlenecks to exist in the first place. So if you can please go to the next slide, we have summarized the causal issues here in this slide. And we grouped the causal issues into four key themes. And so the first two, you can click on the next one, please. Um, issues on the left are related to governance across public and private sectors. The next one, please, on the top right here describes a disconnect between the information system and the systems con context, which includes human capacity and infrastructure. And the one on the bottom right focuses on individual level factors that foster engagement with the system. So this reflected our assessment methodology, which we focus on covering systems issues and how they disrupted the working life of individual actors within the system. I'm taking a moment just to talk about the governance side for both within the public and private sectors. The assessment found an overall lack of governance mechanisms or structures such as functional administrative and technical units, task forces, um, platforms or committees that oversaw the public sector health workforce and supported cross-sectoral coordination. Many human resource administrative processes are also not optimized for efficiency, which increases the burden on already stretched health workers and distracts them from core tasks that they have to accomplish. There are many system actors whose needs are simply not met by the system. In addition, the role of the Ministry of Health in overseeing the community health workforce is not well-defined in most country contexts. These two causal issues show that there is a need to strengthen governance structures and ownership for routine data collection and use for administration and management. This includes increased ownership by conveying and coordinating across different stakeholders to contribute to the design of a system that is better fit for purpose, making sure it works for the people who use it. I know there was also a question around how we can get, um, get actors to coordinate, and it is an important role to play in convening HRH stakeholders and help them to define MOUs or memorandums and understandings between them and in supporting the design of legis legislation on what role HRH data should have and who should have access to it. And there's also a need to create policy clarity for data requirements and use in areas such as performance data and data on community health workers. We also found that systems are not sufficiently adapted to local contexts, especially at subnational levels. They're often designed to the national level. And they're also, also designed with little regard for low data or computer literacy, the absence of regular connectivity or power supply, and the skills and workload of different health workers as we've, as we've discussed throughout this. And as we've seen in the case of Uganda, there are many information systems and each of those have different logins, which create duplicative workflows, systems fatigue, and additional data entry burden, where data entry functions are already under-resourced. So we, we want to design and support human resource information system interventions that are tailored to country needs. And to do that, it's important to build on what systems are already in place and bring them to a better level of agreement to existing infrastructural and capacity constraints. This might require adjustments to system design. So allowing offline data entry capabilities where connectivity is an issue into broader system context, such as having a backup router to ensure connectivity or training to be able to build user data skills, both in terms of um, technology and data use. And going to the, the alignment with actor motivations, we found that systems are not designed in alignment with actor motivations and may lack the incentives needed to, re, to realize desired behavior when it comes to ensuring data quality reporting and use. Disincentives for private sector institutions and workers to report data, low motivation for subnational levels to maintain up to date data, and the reality of health workers' preferences regarding deployment location and attendance tracking are examples of this. It's important to consider raising the profile of key human resources for health data functions, such as data capture and entry, aggregation, data use. And throughout the health system so that system users are better incentivized to engage with the data. This can include giving visibility to HRH data use in routine meetings at national and subnational levels where decisions are made so that, so that this data can be showcased. Um, we've heard of examples too of 
of countries convening conferences where they've been able to showcase the data. And as we look at these causal issues, they, they give a good entry point for proposing solutions that are sustainable and solve for a number of different challenge areas, which we'll discuss on the, on the next slide. So next slide, please. Thank you. The HRH space needs a reliable approach that cost effectively integrates data from multiple sources for improved decision making at scale. Um, addressing this challenge requires active coordination across actors to achieve a strategic shift from reporting systems for the national level to routine administrative and management systems that prioritize the subnational levels and their needs, all based on an established source of truth on the health workforce, which we recognize is hard to do given the, the number of different systems that are in place in country. And what we found is there's no one silver bullet novel solution that's going to make systems work to ensure health for all for each country. The way to get there really depends on where the country is at. For countries with nascent systems in place and workflows that are manual and less efficient, like Burkina Faso, we recommend an approach that builds the foundations for digital, but focuses primarily on improving workflows and thinking about what tasks the HRH actors carry out, what data they need, and then thinking about how digital can support those tasks and needs, including through low resource adaptations of existing ERIS. As we move towards the middle, for countries with strong locally owned systems, but where the use of data is still lacking, and many administrative tasks remain manual, like we saw in Mozambique, we recommend an approach that focuses on supporting greater automation of administrative tasks for improved data quality and use. And for countries with highly complex and decentralized environments where multiple systems exist, as we just heard about in Uganda, but where actors may lack needed data as a result, as, as Vincent was explaining, we recommend focusing on greater integration across disparate HRH data sources. Having one source of truth for HRH data is critical to, to effective human resources for health management. Supporting countries to develop one accurate, up-to-date list of health workers that includes their location is an important intervention area. Building comprehensive facility and health worker registries and implementing data sharing between, between key HRH data sources, such as the ERIS, facility registries, payroll, public service commission database, and HMIS, um, offers a clear opportunity area to strengthen the HRH ecosystem. The entry point for building and expanding these registries will will vary by country according to the policy context. But at the end of the day, frontline health workers count. So we must count frontline health workers, including community health workers. One solution to this issue proposed by partners, including the Community Health Impact Coalition, UNICEF, CHAI, the Global Fund, Living Goods and Health Geolab, is the setup of a national community health worker master list hosted in registries. We are excited to, for the upcoming Q4 launch of a new guidance around this topic to continue strengthening the institutionalization of community health workers in the broader HRH system. And if you take a look in your in the chat um, function, we'll be posting a link there about that, that new guidance. Human resources for health information systems are deeply embedded in the complex public sector governance ecosystem. For each of these recommendations, it is important to work with a variety of partners, not just the Ministry of Health. Other critical actors in this space include the Ministry of Civil Service, Ministry of Finance and Professional Councils. Um, and it's important to bring these different groups together. So bringing together different ministries, departments and relevant stakeholders can ensure ongoing coordination and oversight and help to move towards the goal of a more integrated and effective system. While this seems like a straightforward requirement, the assessment found that this coordination was both rare and difficult to achieve. With ownership and active coordination, it is possible to create a system that meets the needs of users at all administrative levels, especially at the subnational level. This would ideally show a shift from an information system focused on reporting to an administrative system that captures data through the completion of routine HRH tasks. And with that, Andrew, I will pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And um, a great summary, but very rich. And we would encourage uh, those on the call to take the time after the call to have a look at uh, in more detail because these uh, that are summarized by Sarah are explained there. Next slide, please. 
we come to another point um, as we're just uh, compiling our questions uh, where we can ask you to, uh, to do a poll. And this will be a, a poll uh, that is going to ask you about what will be your own next step where you are to improve the human resource system in your country, the HRIS. And for the benefit of our interpretation, will you advocate to Ministry of Health for greater priority to be given to HRIS systems? Will you assess current bottlenecks within existing HRIS systems? Will you prioritize improving the IT system to better collect data? Or will you improve the ability of staff to analyze and use the data? Please take the time to uh, give us your answer and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, for those of you who um, have to leave, um, thank you for joining us. And we invite you to uh, fill in the uh, brief um, questionnaire afterwards. But for those that can remain, there were some fantastic questions that just came on. I would like to invite uh, Sarah, Vincent and Leia to put their cameras back on again. And I'd like to ask uh, Jeff if you can uh, take us to the gallery mode. Um, we've got a couple of really interesting questions and we'll probably have time for a couple of rounds. So I'm gonna to go to read the first uh, question from uh, the, the, the chat. And uh, this question from Catherine, um, what specifically do you recommend that governments, donors and technical assistance providers each do to realize the inclusion of community health workers in broad HRIS and HRH planning? And this question I'm gonna to give to Sarah. Um, Great, thanks. And my colleagues can can feel free to jump in. And I think, I mean, this is this is a, a challenging one depending on how the country is set up. And so as we look at community health workers, I think it's important to try to include them within the facility registries. And as we look at developing out this community health worker registry, finding ways to be able to integrate that into the ERIS. And so Often these community health workers are attached at the facility level. And so if there's ways to be able to, to include them there and within those registries, I think that provides an opportunity then to be able to link to other existing information systems that are available to collect their data. I'm not sure if anyone else has additional um, feedback they'd like to provide on that. All right. I think that's a good summary. And then in the latter part of your presentation, you referred to the, the data registry guidelines that are coming out, which really sort of back up uh, what you were commenting there. Leah, I've got a question for you. Um, what do you envisage as levers for sustainable action to support data production, analysis and utilization? Thank you for that, Andrew. You know, one, one of the things that we uh, saw a lot of, I think, as, as we were thinking about this and, and looking across the different countries was there's sort of a couple of elements there. I think there's an important aspect of leadership um, and you know, at sub-national levels as well. So I think seeing the, the value and use of that data, not only at the national level, but um, feedback going back down to sub-national levels, thinking about the right kind of incentives within sub-national levels as well to keep that information um, up, up to date. Um, and other elements, I think, is that you know, one, of the, one of the tensions that we um, saw in a number of countries was you know, potentially in some way a perception of seeing HRIS systems as more of a reporting tool um, but kind of keeping those alive more up to date by actually sort of supporting a transformation and a shift into a mindset of more of an administrative and management tool from a day-to-day -to -day basis. Um, and, and, and that, I think, will also sort of serve to support and encourage integration of data across systems rather than what we see um, in, in, in a number of countries and, and, and which was shared earlier today, number of systems existing across various units and departments um, that then sort of requires a fair amount of effort to bring that in, into one, one, uh, one specific system. 
Mm, thanks, Larry. And I think your, your point about um, making the data actionable and people needing that data to, to take action is being really important. Uh, Dr. Dr. Vincent, I've got a question for you. I'd encourage you to show your video if your bandwidth allows. We'd love to see you. And um, can I ask you this question, please? Which stakeholders are best positioned to take these recommendations forward? As your earlier slide suggested, there were many different ministries involved with their own systems. Who's going to lead this? How do we move this forward? Thanks, Dr. Vincent. Thank you. Um, the main stakeholder that take this forward is Minister of Health, because Minister of Health, at the end of the day, is the accountable ministry for the health workforce, for the health uh, sector performance, and for the and the, for the welfare of the health workforce. And um, they are very good at mobilizing partners. They have a wide range of partners. They are respected. They. Of course, they do the policy development, they do the strategic, the strategy development, and they are able to review policies and review strategies to incorporate some of these suggestions that would improve the health, human sources for health information system. They can also, using the office of the prime minister, for example, catalyze the process of bringing other key stakeholders stakeholders to work together to, to reduce fragmentation so that they can develop more cohesive plans, more co cohesive reports, and also promote sharing information in the form that can be used. And that documents are usually most respected by all the stakeholders. Once a document is coming from the Minister of Health, that is well respected and, and used. And so if they took leadership in this, everything would work out well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. And um, we'll get to a few more, but those questions we don't, we'll take on notice uh, and follow up with some answers as part of the packet we send you from this one. Um, Leah, I'm going to go back for you uh, for a question that was in the chat. Technical issues are usually fixable, but governance is needed to negotiate between stakeholders. What approaches do you recommend for coordinating these information systems? That's such a great question. And that's something we were, you know, I, I think became a little bit of a mantra as we were um, uh, working on, 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 on this as well. Sometimes the technical issues are easy to fix. The question is, um, how do you bring well, the stakeholders together? How do you, um, uh, and, and one, of, one of the things, and I'll, I'll go back to a point that I, I made earlier and that um, we heard looking um, at, the, at, at the findings, there's so many stakeholders involved within this specific space. I think more so than um, if you're looking, for example, at a disease um, a specific program, um, because this sort of spans across a number of ministries, a number of departments, across the private sector, across, there's just a number of stakeholders that need to be brought um, in, in, into the bear. And so that, that I think is just really critical in terms of designing the right kind of governance that has the various stakeholders that are involved in HRH management and making sure that they are at, at the table. Um, that's, that's one really important aspect. And we, we, we saw that in a, number, in a couple of countries, sort of thinking about starting with what a country has um, and expanding outside of that to include sort of the needs of multiple um, multiple different stakeholders is um, is is a is some of the examples that we saw um, in terms of uh, how to really sort of uh, make sure that you're bringing in all these people. Uh, another element I think that's really important when we're thinking about the private sector, for example, is um, what type of incentives are at at play. So, you know, through our, through our interviews, a number of people said that there might be a lack of incentives for the private sector to share information. Um, in some ways, um, some stakeholders maybe have a certain fear um, in terms of what kind of, you know, of, of that kind of reporting. So the design of incentives that encourage that sharing is an important aspect of governance that needs to be 
thought about for this too. Mm. Uh, governance and motivation keeps coming up as a theme. So we're rapidly running out of time and we could have this conversation for a lot longer, but I want to come back to each of the panelists. I've got one last question that I want each of you to respond to. And that is, as you consider the results and recommendations of the study, what would be the one key message that you would like today's participants to take away with them? One key message. Dr. Vincent, can I ask for your one key message first? One key message I would want everybody to take with is um, human resource information is critical for management of the health workforce and accounting for the health workforce and would be a key in advocacy for improved investment in the health workforce and even improving the quality of healthcare because then you would do, you would have sufficient evidence to make your case and also to show progress and account for resources that you have been given mm -hmm. mm. thank you um, a very wise and really cutting answer. If we could do that, we would be doing really well. So thank you. Sarah, your wisdom for us. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think just to reiterate a little bit of what Leah was just saying, I think it's important to get the ERIS right. And so it's it does require coordination. It's, it requires a number of things, but it's, as we saw, digital solutions are, are necessary components and definitely part of the recommendations that we have, but they aren't the silver bullet for everything. And at the end of the day, they can't fix everything. And so if you have inefficient workflows, if you don't understand the user needs, putting a digital system on top of that doesn't fix it. It actually just mm. amplifies some of the issues that are there. And so I think it is important to meet countries where they are and to really understand who are the users and that can expand into relevant stakeholders as well. Um, what do those users need? What do they need data-wise for decision-making so that they can actually be motivated to use the data because the data comes back as something that is relevant and important to them. And then looking at how we can build the system to be able to, to address those needs so that it is better fit for purpose. And so I think we often jump in in, in designing and, and move forward, but I think it is really important for us to take a step back and, and look at those needs that are there so that this can be fit for purpose and can address some of these causal issues mm. that we've seen. Mm, thank you, Sarah, very thoughtful. Uh, Leah, what would you like to finish us off with? <laughs> um, I think, you know, going back to the importance of bringing in various stakeholders at all levels of the health system, making this not only a Ministry of Health point, but also thinking about, um, how to bring in different um, areas within government that have a role in this, um, as well as the strengthening of other departments um, that have a role to play in the monitoring and of, of, of the health, health workforce. So um, I think that really sort of multi-stakeholder, multi-governance piece needs to be um, really at, at the forefront um, mm -hmm. here. Great, uh, thank you very much. So let's find out what our attendees are going to do. Jeff, do you mind putting up the results of the, the, the last poll? Let's see the intention of the audience. Again, well split, split across, the, across the answers. And I think this comes back to the response that's needed is important to understand that local context. So um, thank you everyone for, for, for doing that. As you're leaving, you'll see that there is a um, survey that comes up. But before you go, I would like to go to the next slide, please. Um, there is a lot of detailed resources that are available. Next slide again, thanks, Jeff. Um, we will send out a link to those. Um, there is the overall report itself. And then each of the country deep dives are have been sectioned off to allow you to have a more easy read of the country that would interest you. On the screen and in the follow-up information packet are the contact details of a couple of our team. And in the survey questions that you will have today, you will have the opportunity to ask for one of uh, the consortium members to follow you up if you would like to have more detailed discussions today. So thank you so much for being with us. We've been on a journey that journey is trying to look at the big picture of human resources for health data and information systems. 
we heard about the importance of the digital landscape from Brooke. It's the year of the healthcare worker, but without that data, we can't really understand what's happening and make good decisions. Polly reminded us of the importance of those human resources information systems to make them work. And please join with me in thanking uh, Leah, Sarah, and Dr. Vincent for great and timely presentations that seek to give us not only a picture of what's happening across a number of countries, both strengths and weaknesses, but also a little bit of a, a roadmap of actions we can take that are feasible and incremental, but considering local context, so that together we can improve the availability of data to better manage human resources so that patients and families in countries can get the healthcare they need. Thank you so much. And we'll be back in touch with the packet afterwards. And I wish you a pleasant day. Bye for now. Thank you.